Okay, maybe I'm insulting your intelligence a little bit here, but it's time to take you to school when it comes to real ear measurement. Hey guys, welcome back to the Dr. Cliff AUD vlog. This is vlog number 243, and today I'm talking about a very common misconception when it comes to real ear measurement. But before I get into this video, do me a huge favor, click the like button, I really appreciate it. And if you are not yet subscribed to the channel with notifications turned on, go ahead and do that as well so you do not miss any of my newly published videos. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So real ear measurement, first and foremost, is a form of verification of hearing aid programming. It is not it, programming in and of itself. It's verifying the programming that you're doing with a hearing aid. Uh, very simple setup here. We're actually putting probe microphone tubes inside of your ears along with your hearing aids and we're playing sound from a speaker in front of you so we can measure the amount of amplification that you're actually receiving from your hearing aids to ensure that you are hitting your prescriptive targets or uh, rather to ensure that we understand what that sound is doing inside of your ear canal and ideally programming you to your prescriptive targets. But here's where a lot of hearing care professionals go wrong and this ultimately leads to a lot of failed hearing aid fittings when they're using real ear measurement and is a leading reason why a lot of professionals do not use real ear measurement inside of their clinic. So uh, when we think about real ear measurement, a lot of people really don't think about it the right way. We're basically using it to see what the sound is doing inside of your ear canal. And ideally, we're programming the amplification levels of the hearing aids throughout a variety of different frequencies to match the prescription of your hearing loss to ensure that you have access to missing auditory information, but not giving you so much that it's too loud, and then of course not giving you too little to make it inaudible. And then on top of that, we're also verifying to make sure that we're giving the proper amount of amplification for average level speech, loud level speech, soft level speech, maximum power output of the hearing aids, all of these different things we are verifying with real ear measurement. So when it comes to the argument that a lot of professionals use, which is anytime I program someone using real ear measurement to verify, it's making everything too loud and they can't tolerate it. So I just don't do it because otherwise they're gonna say, I don't like how these hearing aids sound and they're gonna return them for a refund and then I can't stay in business. So I can kind of understand the premise of that. The problem is, is that these providers are just not doing real ear measurement the right way way. First and foremost, you have to understand prescriptions for hearing loss. Now, there's a variety of different prescriptions out there. There are some validated prescriptions like NAL, NL1, NAL, NL2, DSL. Those are verified prescriptive methods. You also have unverified prescriptive methods that you would get that are the manufacturer proprietary prescriptions, which are actually designed not to give you the best speech intelligibility or uh, 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 performance when it comes to your hearing aid. They're designed for optimal comfort with the audibility so you don't return your hearing aids for a refund, but you also don't get the full amount of benefit from those hearing aids. So that's a huge uh, dilemma or huge problem that exists out there, which is exactly why real ear measurement has to be done on every single fitting. Now, let's get back to these verified prescriptive methods. So these verified prescriptive methods are basically determined based off of individuals that are being fit with hearing aids. And in this particular case, the NAL-NL2, which is arguably the most common prescription that's out there, stands for National Acoustics Laboratory Nonlinear 2. It's the second version of this particular prescription. The goal of the NAL-NL2 prescription procedure is to make speech as clear as possible while keeping the overall loudness comfortable for the listener. Now, when it comes to this prescription, the way that they determine this prescription is it's based off of a distribution of a lot of people. We're talking and nearly 10,000 individuals, uh, they identified the optimal audibility for these individuals for optimal performance. And anytime that you do that, what do you get? We'll take you back here to some statistics, maybe from high school or college. You get a distribution which is shown or illustrated on a bell curve. So let's talk about a bell curve here really quick. You've probably seen bell curves before. It typically starts low, it goes high, and then it goes back down low again. But you can that's a normal distribution. You could have a variety of different types of distributions. But for this particular case, 
I'll use the normal bell curve for the explanation. So when you look at these individuals who performed at their best with hearing aids amplified to the NAL NL2 prescription, we identified that there are some people who need less amplification than their NAL NL2 prescription, some people who need right at their prescription, and some people who need more than their prescription calls for, for them to hear their absolute best and have good auditory comfort at the same time. And so when you're programming a pair of hearing aids and you're using real ear measurement to verify that you're hitting your prescriptive target, for a percentage of individuals, that is going to be too much amplification. But it also, on some individuals, is going to be too little amplification. So what's happening here is that a lot of people who are especially new to hearing aids, they're not used to getting the full amount of sound, right? You've been in auditory deprivation for sometimes seven to 10 years, and to expect to receive the full amount of amplification from a hearing aid on day one of getting fit with those hearing aids is unrealistic. So if a hearing care professional is expecting that when they run real ear measurements and they match you to your prescription, they're expecting you to do your best there when in reality, maybe you will because there's a certain percentage of people who can tolerate that day one, but there's a lot of people who are not ready to tolerate that full amount of amplification. So they have to be backed down from that amplification level. And when you look at the best practices that exist inside of the world of audiology, you do not have to go and program someone dead onto their prescription and leave them there, that you can make adjustments off of that based on personal perception. So what you should be doing, or rather what the hearing care professional should be doing, is making alterations of that program, bringing you down in overall amplification level, and then over several weeks, because it typically takes the brain about 30 days to fully acclimate the sound, they should be based Maybe stepping you up into the full prescription so you can hear your absolute best after that adaptation period. Now, there are some individuals who actually need to go above their full prescription, and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, not above. Yes, you sometimes have to go above your prescription for you to hear your best. That's because you might have been one of the individuals throughout this testing that are in this distribution that needed significantly more amplification than the NAL NL2 prescription called for for you to hear your best. So anytime that I hear a hearing care professional make a blanket statement saying, I don't do real ear measurement because every time I do real ear measurement, it makes me over amplify the patient and they end up not liking the amplification. And it's like, well, no freaking kidding. I mean, what were you taught in school? That wasn't what I was taught in school. What school did you go to? Like, this is just is basic stuff. And here's the thing. If you did go to a bad program that didn't teach you these concepts, go and read the research. Go and read what you're supposed to actually be doing when it comes to programming hearing aids and verifying that programming using real ear measurement. It's not a dogmatic approach where you're like, okay, if I do real ear measurement, everyone has to be at their full prescription. I don't care if you like it. I don't care if it sounds like garbage. I, I have to leave you there because that's what best practices say. That is not what best practices say. That's not even what the minimal standard says. The minimal standard says that you program someone to validated prescriptive targets and you make adjustments off of those prescriptive targets if necessary, or as necessary, I think is how it technically reads. So basically, you need to make sure that you actually know what the sound is doing inside of someone's ears, because I can tell you this, 100%, 100% of people who are programmed without using real ear measurement to verify what their amplification is doing inside of their ears, your provider has no understanding of how much amplification you're getting at different frequency ranges. They're looking at their computer software and it's taking it's not taking into account at all your specific ear canal anatomy. And this drives me crazy because it's like, people just have no idea what they're doing with real ear measurement. It drives me absolutely bonkers up the wall. But hopefully you're going to a hearing up provider who is actually following best practices. They're using verification the way that it was intended to measure the sound inside of your ears so they can verify that they understand what that sound is doing and then attempting to match your prescriptive targets and then making adjustments off of your prescriptive targets based on feedback from you. That is the proper way to fit and program a pair of hearing aids is by verifying it so the provider actually knows what's going on. Um, I can tell you this. I would be a horrible audiologist if it wasn't for me using objective measures to understand what you're actually receiving from a pair of hearing aids. I said it. I would be absolute garbage dog trash. Like, 
like I would not go to me if I'd had no ability to verify what I was actually doing in the clinic. It's almost as egregious as being like, oh, tell me like, where are you struggling to hear? Okay, well, I'm gonna make an assumption then of what your hearing test would be without actually testing your hearing. Because you know what, listen, I can understand based on things you're telling me likely what you need. So let me just put some hearing aids in your ears and tell me what you think how they sound like, right? Um, that would be the same exact thing. Like we do hearing testing to verify what your hearing loss actually is. The chances are is that you actually have a hearing loss because you're coming in and telling us you have a hearing loss, but how do we verify that that's actually true? We perform a hearing test to verify that. So if I have one more hearing care professional come to me and say, Cliff, I don't do real or measurement because it makes the hearing aids too loud. I'm like, well, then go back to audiology school because your school ripped you off. I don't know what to tell you at this point. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry that this comes across as me being elitist. Uh, like, do I think I went to the best school in the world? Probably not. But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility as a hearing care professional to actually understand the things that you're doing and what you should and should not be doing as a hearing care professional, regardless of if you're an audiologist or a hearing instrument specialist, because we all have the ability to be good and we all have the ability to be bad. And you know what? There's plenty of good and plenty of bad on both sides. And it really just comes down to if you're gonna follow the best practices and understand how to follow them, okay? So I know that this comes across as a very insensitive rant today, but you know, I'm just sick of hearing care professionals not doing the right thing and coming up with excuses not to follow best practices when they clearly know that there are certain foundational things they should be doing and should be doing a particular way to achieve an optimal outcome because the research says so.